one of the traditional images of mind and concentration, or of the awakened mind, is a lotus growing out of the mud. In the tropics, the mud is, is pretty rank, and yet you get this lovely flower with a very gentle smell and leaves that repel the water, flowers that repel the water, so they can grow up in muddy water. And yet when the flower opens, it's very white and pure. The same with the mind. So it gets past its greed, anger, and delusion, passion, aversion, delusion. It can blossom. We can compare it to the mind living in this body, which as the chant says, is full of all kinds of unclean things. Yet the mind can be clean, the mind can be pure. In fact, you can use the contemplation of the body as a means of purifying the mind, because the more you see that the, the body isn't yours, the more the mind stands out on its own. So it's useful to contemplate the body. Sometimes it's forced on us, like today. All that stuff that came out of the sewage pipe, where did that come from? Human bodies. And John Fuhrman once had a pair of students who were interesting that they, as they would meditate, husband and wife, they would tend to have very similar experiences in their meditation at the same time. And there was one period when they both got really disgusted with food. The wife had to actually work in the kitchen to feed the rest of the family. So she was fixing a piece of liver one day, and there was a, I know it was a dog or a cat came by, and so she threw a little piece to it, and it just was so eager to get that. And she herself was disgusted by the stuff. So they came to this a point where they really couldn't eat. So they mentioned this to a John Fu, and he said, well, that's not the purpose of the contemplation. Because after all, what do you have in your body? You've got a liver, too. You've got a stomach, too. You've got this stuff in your intestines. You're no different from the food. The body's no different from the food. And both of them were able to overcome their sense of disgust. The purpose of the contemplation is not to get you so that you can't eat. But it is get to get you to the point where you have a sense of dispassion. This body you've been carrying around and been so proud of and so protective of. The mind has so much invested in it. You've got to get to a point where you can step back from it and say, oh, that's just the way the body is. It's not really worth holding on to. You use it as a tool. And the best use of the body is to use it in the practice. But beyond that, you've got to question the mind's eager holding on to it. Because when you can learn to let go of those concerns about the survival of the body, you find that the mind lightens to a great deal. But as John Lee was fond of pointing out, the, the filthiness of the body is nothing compared with the filthiness of the mind when it's not trained, because the body is just the nature of the body. It's not pretending to be anything that it isn't. But the mind filled with passion, aversion, and delusion, that's really what you've got to cleanse away. 
mind filled with the, the defilements, with the hindrances, all these forms of ignorance, the manifestations of ignorance in all of its different ways. That's what really prevents the mind from being luminous. from being pure. So you've really got to work on those things. You've got to learn how to question whichever defilements you tend to be invested in. Look at all the, the harm that they cause. We don't like to look at this, as Bhaskar Ghee often comments. These are, these are things we tend to prefer not to see, rather focus on how good and pure we are. But if we don't look at the other side, we're not going to be able to cleanse it away. Look at that pipe today. If we just let it happen, let it stay the way it was, it just continue to fester and just get worse and worse and worse. So it's too good, at, good to dig out those, and this is a very apt analogy for today, those roots of unskillful behavior, greed, aversion, delusion. Try to get the mind as still and independent as you can in the present moment, so you can look back on these things, back on the times when you've given in to these roots of unskillful behavior. You reflect on how much harm you've done to yourself, how much harm you've done to other people. So you can value the opportunity to say no to those defilements. Call them into question and see where you can uproot them. Because you can't just simply let go of these things by hiding the mind away in concentration. They'll be quiet for a while, but they're still there, just like the roots in the septic system. And there's a tendency sometimes when the mind does get quiet, you just don't want to look at these things. You'd rather pretend that they're not there, that they're gone. And that attitude, of course, just allows them to fester. So when the mind does settle down and is still, learn to look at it and say, okay, where are the seeds that would make you still want to go after greed, aversion, and delusion? What kind of attitudes does the mind have that fosters these things? That likes to stay invested, likes to keep them around as pets. It's this ability to question your old allegiances. That's an important part of the meditation, an important part of training the mind. This is why they say the lotus grows in the mud. You have to learn to look at your own defilements. You have to learn how to look at your own, I mean, your own weak points. Not so that you should get down on yourself, but so you learn how not to identify with those things. You say, well, they've been there in the mind, but they don't have to be. I've sided with those things in the past, but I don't have to in the future. I don't have to right now. But you have to understand their allure. We had a discussion a while back about how someone was saying the only pure Buddhist practice is just watching things arise and pass away. And that was not what the Buddha said. That's part of seeing things come and go. You want to see when there's greed and when there's no greed, when there's aversion and no aversion, delusion and no delusion. You want to see these things as they come, as they go, so that you can notice what they come along with, and when they go, what goes, goes along with them, to so realize that they're not necessarily part of them innate nature of the mind. They're just events that come and go. But they come and go in patterns. And the reason we latch onto them is because they have a certain allure. And as we all know, much of that allure is something we give to them. We paint them in nice colors. We like the way they look once they've been painted up to our, to our taste. 
but then you've got to see the drawbacks. Okay, these things really do cause harm. They wreak havoc in the mind, they wreak havoc in the relations with other people. So you can begin to compare the allure with the drawbacks. So the mind gets more motivated to, to see the escape from these things. So that's the mud that you have to go through. But through going through that mud and analyzing these things and understanding them, that's when the discernment arises that can cleanse the mind. As the Buddha said, the mind is cleansed through discernment. It's not cleansed through concentration. Concentration allows the discernment to do its work, but the, the discernment is what makes all the difference. So even though we don't like to look at our defilements, and there is a tendency as we get into concentration, you just want to hang out in the concentration. But the Buddha compares that to we got another analogy that's appropriate for today. It's a cesspool outside of a village. It's just allowed to grow and grow and grow. All that stagnant water just gets to stay there. It doesn't get to flow away until you make a breakthrough through ignorance. Once you made that breakthrough, okay, then it then it all flows away. So the concentrated mind that just allows the defilements to stay there and doesn't want to touch them, doesn't want to deal with them. That's the cesspool. It's the discernment that can grow out of all that mud. That's what purifies the mind and leads to a state of awakening. So use the concentration to get the mind in a position where it is willing to look at its own drawbacks instead of focusing on things outside. John Mahabhu makes a comment about how we have this tendency. If there's mud in our minds, we tend to sling it around in other people. There's something wrong with that person, something wrong with this person. The teacher's no good. These my fellow Dharma practitioners are no good. The mud gets slung around. But you have to see, well, where does it come from? It actually comes from inside. So you've got to learn how to turn around and look at it and see, oh, it's really there. It really is mud. But as you learn how to analyze it and see it, See it for what it is. The mind gets clearer and clearer. This is the, the nourishment for the lotus. So remember that the concentration is here as a tool. It's not an end in and of itself. This can be discouraging when you're having trouble getting into concentration. It's a good warning. When the concentration comes, after a lot of difficulty, you tend to really hang on to it. And as long as you're hanging on for the purpose of developing it as a tool, that's perfectly fine. There will come the point, though, where you have to start turning around and doing more work. But the concentration there is there to help you have the energy and have the solid foundation that's needed to get the work done. so that the lotus can bloom.